Well, welcome back. Uh, my understanding is that I'll give a little talk on this concept of wise friendship, and then we can open it up to question and answers. And I guess I wanted to start with the uh, mantra that I offered, uh, breathing in, I have arrived, breathing out, I am home. And that mantra is actually, it's a beautiful sign at Plum Village. And the, the first time that I went to Plum Village when I was just 20 years old, arriving there uh, in France, that um, it was one of the first teachings that, that Ty uh, taught that you have your home within you. And the home is in the, the present moment. The home is in our um, capacity to be present with whatever shows up for us. And when I was a little girl, people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I would, I would say I wanted to be a snail. I actually was fascinated by snails. I thought snails just had it made because they had their home on their back, wherever they went. And they had the ability to kind of go inside and have this safe space within themselves. But then they would also put their little bodies out into the world again and, and kind of move about at their own pace. And that to me is, is a practice of um, breathing in, I've arrived, breathing out, I'm home. We know about Thich Nhat Hanh being a refugee, that here he was a Vietnamese monk who had to find a new home in France, right? In this very beautiful countryside of France, which is very different than uh, Vietnam in terms of climate and people and language. And yet he had the capacity as a refugee to find a home there and make a home for hundreds and thousands of people that have come through um, this land. So breathing in, I'm, I've arrived, breathing out, I, I'm home can mean a lot of things to ourselves. Uh, and it's a beautiful mantra uh, to practice. It also has that mm sound at the end, which we now know from polyvagal theory, uh, activates our vagus nerve if we actually say it out loud, or we just start to bring into that humming kind of quality within ourselves. And the timing of it is the timing of, of the beautiful soothing rhythm breath that also activates our vagus nerve, which activates our compassion system. The qualities of a wise friend, if we look at that Kalyana Mita uh, Sutta, it says these kind of, it's kind of intense. It's like they do what, what is hard to do. They endure what is hard to endure. And uh, when we think about friendship with ourselves, it is, yes, bringing this, this first quality of compassion that we practiced together to be present with our, to our, with ourselves, to not abandon ourselves, as, as it said in the Kalyanda, Kalyana Mita Sutta, to not look down on ourselves when we're down and out, but rather to see ourselves with that common humanity of um, compassion. But it's also to show up right? To show up and to stay aligned with our values. And the type of therapy that I practice is something called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or Training. And ACT is really based on this uh, concept of what is important to you? How do you want to show up? And how can you show up as that version of you, even when life gets difficult? How, you can, how can you show up for yourself in alignment with your values? And how can you show up for others? And these, these values are actually really uh, central to our capacity to be wise friends to ourselves because we show up with compassion for sure, but also we show up with the strength and commitment to be the version of us that we want to be in the world. In ACT, values are uh, more... Uh, qualities, their verbs and adverbs, then they are, um, you know, sort of static uh, domains. So for example, when I work on values with clients, oftentimes people will say things like, I value my health, or I value parenting, or I value my work. And I don't let them stop there. I want to know when you are valuing your health, what that looks like in your day to day. Like if I was videotaping you and I could follow you around in your day, showing up how you want to show up in relationship to your health, what would I see you doing? Those are your values. They're the verbs. They're the actions. 
same thing with valuing your friendships or valuing your, you know, valuing being a parent. Last night, uh, my son came home. He had hit a, he's a 11 year old and he was in a baseball game and he plays catcher. And I, I didn't know a lot about baseball until my son started playing back baseball, but catcher is a rough, it's a rough position to play because you get no glory. Nobody really cares about the catcher. But you also have high potential to mess up. And because there's so many balls coming your way, your job is to catch the frame frame for the pitcher and catch the ball, right? And there was three runs scored in the game that they lost. And all three of those runs were because my son dropped the ball and someone came in home, ran home when you dropped the ball. So he came home and he was pretty, um, pretty upset. And he did, you know, what many of us do when we're upset, he shut down and he put a big sign. He closed the door to his room and he put, put, put a big sign on his door that said, stay out. I don't want to talk. Right. So we can think about that for ourselves, how we, when we're suffering, when we're struggling, when we're embarrassed, when we feel shame, how we have that tendency to shut out ourselves, either shut out from other people or even from our own very selves that we will close off parts of ourselves. And in in our practice, we practice these three qualities, right? We practice the quality of compassion, we practice the quality of values, and we practice the quality of loosen up a little bit, flexibility, shift a perspective. And so if I were to say I, I value being a parent, the question is, what do I do as a parent to model to my son wise friendship, to show him how he can be with himself when he's struggling in this moment. So the first thing that I did is I opened the door and I just said, I love you. I can tell you're having a hard time. I'm available if you need me. I'm in my room just reading. I'm going to come check on you in about 10 minutes. (laughs) So that practice of, um, of showing up with compassion for ourselves, of being a wise friend to ourselves is that, that pause to say, Hey, I'm having a hard time. I can see that I'm having a hard time and I'm here for you. As it says in the Kalyanamita Sutta, we don't abandon ourselves. And maybe we give ourselves a little bit of space because sometimes we don't want to quite go there. I mean, we just need some space, right? So, but, 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 but it's a compassionate, loving presence. The second quality that we can bring is the quality of our values, of what's important because in um, when we hurt, when we're struggling, it's because we care about something. If my son didn't care about baseball, he wouldn't come home and shut the door and close himself off. If you didn't care about um, you know climate change or our planet, then you wouldn't be disturbed when you read certain news um, articles. If you didn't care about your siblings or your parents, then you wouldn't be so upset when they're having a hard time or maybe when you feel distant from them. The line and act is you hurt where you care and you care where you hurt. So when we contact that hurt within ourselves or with another person, we can also see that there's, there's something in there. There's a value in there. There's some way, there's some quality that's important to us, right? So when I checked in 10 minutes later and I go in and I kind of crawl into his bed with him, I, I said to him, honey, this hurts so much because you really care about how you show up in baseball and you care about your team and you care about yourself and, and tell me more about what you care about that makes this hurt. When you can identify what it is that you care about, then you can do what is hard to do. That quality of the Kalyanamita Sutta. Doing what is hard to do is acting on that care, even if it hurts. Acting on that care, even if it hurts, for my son will be showing up at practice the next day instead of just avoiding. Acting on that care when it hurts may be for you contacting that person that you're estranged from, or maybe Um, speaking up in a conversation where you feel like something needs to be said. And that is being a true friend to yourself. 
You know, that's a true moment of demonstrating to yourself. I have values. I have things that I care about. And even though it's uncomfortable, I'm going to show up. So the first quality is being compassionate, being present, being there for yourself, offering that loving warmth. The second quality is your values. And what's interesting about values in terms of the research, the psychological research on values, is that they seem to be really a key component in our ability to be motivated and do hard things. So for example, Stephen Hayes had um, a study where he had people go into a spinning class, like an exercise class, and half of the people were randomized to receive exercise instructions from the American Academy of Exercise, things like spin harder and hold your spine straight and, uh, you know, uh, breathe, breathe with, um, you know, your effort. And then the other half were asked ahead of time, why do you care about exercise? Why is it important to you? What matters to you in terms of exercise and taking care of your body? And the half that was told that was, um, then, then what they did is they wrote them down on note cards and they gave them to people as they were spinning. So half of the people got the exercise advice and half of the people got the values. And the half that received their personal reasons why exercise is important to them, how they want to show up, what's important to them, not only did they spin harder, they spinned longer, right? So when we access our values, when we go into ourselves, we come back home to ourselves and remember what's important to us, it actually can be an inner resource. And that's really what friendship is, right? Being, being a resource to yourself. So the third quality, if we have the first quality being present, the second being compassionately present, the second quality showing up with our values, the third quality of um, really wise friendship has to do with flexibility, has to do with flexibility. And uh, I'm really interested in evolutionary psychology and, and evolution and how it, how it informs our, our behavior as humans. And there's one thing that we know about evolution is that variability, variability in behavior, variability in genetics, var variability, having a lot of variety, uh, diversity is actually what supports evolution. And being flexible in your repertoire supports your behavioral evolution. When we get rigid, when we get stuck in our thoughts, inflexible in the way that we see things, which is what we can tend to do when we are um, not feeling safe, then we're less likely to adapt with change. We all need to loosen up a little bit. So with flexibility, uh, going back to that story of my son, Flexibility is asking him, once he feels the support, once he feels the values, the third part of it is, and what do you want to try differently next time? What do you want to try? What do you want to explore? What are you curious about? Not from you were wrong, but from the stance of we're all continuing to grow. And this is what growing feels like. Growing feels like people scoring on you. <laughs> Growing feels like making mistakes. And then you have this opportunity for flexibility to try something different and to have a flexible sense of yourself that you're, you're not stuck here. That is a, a great friend that can help you grow and can help you learn and can help you adapt. So these three qualities of compassionate presence, tapping into your values and being flexible, letting go, kind of being playful and exploring are central to being a good friend to yourself. But they're also central to you being a good friend to others because we can think about how we could show up for others in a way that is compassionate when they're struggling. How can we show up in a way that remembers what's most important here? What are our values? And then how can we show up in a way that's flexible and open and willing to have our mind changed? When I go to Plum Village in the summers with my uh, family, and um, when we were there a couple summers ago on the family retreat, it was the 40th anniversary of Plum Village, and they had created a walking path for Thai 
um, that was paved so that he could be wheeled down the walking path after he had his stroke. And along that path, there were um, these beautiful banners. And the banners said things like, um, I've arrived, I am home. Uh, precious moment, beautiful moment. But one of my favorite banners was this beautiful banner along the path that just said, are you sure? Question mark. <laughs> are you sure? And that to me really um, highlighted the, the flexibility of it all, you know, not to be so sure to hold it all quite lightly. So this practice of um, being present with ourselves with compassion, knowing what matters and living that out through our actions and then being in the place of openness, flexibility, looseness is really the kindest practice that we can offer ourselves um, in our wise friendship. So I'd love to open up, um, maybe open up our discussion from there into conversation amongst us. And it looks like some of you have uh, have some experience with ACT. That's um, definitely my home base. And I have a book called The ACT Daily Journal, which walks you through these six core processes of what's called psychological flexibility, as well as a lot of teachings of ACT and self-compassion in my book that's out right now called The Self-Compassion Daily Journal. And I really think ACT is a, um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful marriage of the science a psychological science with the what's been taught in contemplative practice all along and uh, is very consistent with um, a lot of the Buddhist teachings as well. Any questions from the group or any questions that you want to put in the chat I or comments, I'd welcome. Can you unmute, Eugenie? Yes. I okay, can. go for it. Do it yourself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Um, okay, I was really um, interested in what you were mentioning about values, showing up in alignment with values. Um, so, <clears throat> so often, um, you know, we, we don't always know what our values are. Yeah. So it's almost like we need to back up first and do that work. Yes. Right. So I was wondering what you can say about that and how to attend to your own needs in relation to the values that um, either you may still be needing to get clear on or if you're working with someone else, helping them get clear on. Yes. Well, this is a lot of what I do in terms of my work as a therapist is values called values clarification. And there's two ways in which um, I'm listening, what I'm listening to as a therapist, as a client is speaking, and also what I encourage my clients to start to listen to within themselves, two entry points into values. So, and this is from the ACT perspective. So one entry point is what brings you vitality. When you are engaging in a certain domain, whether it's the domain of your work or the domain of um, working with your uh, dog or the domain of friendship and you feel that uplifting of energy and you feel that vitality and that sense of this is the essence of how I want to be. This excites me. This energizes me. This gives me meaning. This gives me purpose. This gives me another um, term, which is called psychological richness, that feeling of interest and engagement and novelty. Mm -hmm. That would be probably a way in which you are living out your values. And sometimes we can stamp them with words. Like we can, you know, we, I, I oftentimes it's something we, we can't even put words on, but words uh, may be things like, uh, oh, wow, I'm being really adventurous or I'm being honest or I'm being brave or um, in this moment I'm being, I'm really kind of humorous or playful. Those may be some values. But the other entry point is one that I was tapping into, which is the entry point of what brings you pain or what, what do you regret? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we avoid those things. We avoid our regrets or we avoid our pains, but our pains tell us a lot about what we care about, the discrepancies between how, how we sh wish that we had shown up and we didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a good amount of research into regrets. There's a um, really beautiful book by uh, Daniel Pink called The Power of Regret, where 
he surveyed over 9,000 people about this very simple question of what do you regret? And it, when he got all of the answers in, he started to do uh, a qualitative analysis of what were these categories of regret. And they tended to fall into four types of categories, which had to do with boldness. Sometimes we regret not being bold and showing up. Uh, connection regrets, those moments that we uh, lost connection with somebody, we let a relationship rift, or maybe we acted in ways that broke a connection with somebody. There's uh, moral regrets, which can tell us a lot about our values, maybe ways we acted towards others or, or towards ourselves that were against our, our own morals. And then there's foundation regrets, which are the sort of sl slow and subtle over time regrets that build that we wish we had tended to our life differently. So like, I wish I wore more sunscreen or I flossed more often, or, you know, yeah. I wish that I'd saved my finances and those two things, looking at your regrets and looking at what brings you vitality can help you start to kind of think about and feel into you personally, what is important to you and everybody's values are different. What's important to you is different from what's important to me. I do think ultimately most values, if you boil them all down, they boil down to love, but, um, mm -hmm. but you can also get into different types. There's all sorts of, there's values, um, clarification exercises online that have a lot of different ways in which lists of values, uh, things like that you could explore. Yeah. So, I'm just, I'm also wondering like in personal relationships, because we're talking about wise friend and being wise friend to yourself, Yeah. right? Uh, as well as to others so so you know especially those of us who are, seem to be able to be wise friends to others but then you have to attend to your own needs you're finding that maybe you you the, in some interactions you okay you're you're mentioning pain is another entry point right mm -hmm. so you can say like, okay this creates emotional pain for me so then what is my value around this is that what right. you're saying? Right. So maybe if it's creating emotional, I mean, it would be helpful to have a specific example, but if it's creating emotional pain for you, then probably there's some kind of value that's activated there. Maybe it's a value of I'm not feeling respected in this relationship and respect mm -hmm. is a value of mine. Or um, I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling heard. I'm not feeling appreciated and being appreciation and being heard and being a, a present compassionate listener is a value of mine. And right. the, yeah. And we can't control, we can't control other people's right. actions towards us. Right. Yeah. But what we can do is identify, okay, I'm not feeling respected in this relationship. Respect is a, is a value of mine. How am I going to show up with some respect right now for myself? And that may be I'm showing up with self-respect by setting a limit in the relationship, leaving a relationship, setting boundaries with somebody, or it may be I'm going to give myself the respect that I feel that person isn't giving me, or I'm going to find ways in which I can show respect to others. And the chances of you getting respect back are higher if you act from a place of respect, right? Yeah. So, and so, yeah. so that is the thing then, how do you show that respect to yourself or how do you show yourself you see yourself how do you do that yeah exactly do you have a do you have a way in which you do that in which you show respect to yourself or see yourself well so one is you know like you mentioned it's like through boundaries yeah. but the other one you know you you're mentioning this other way like you said okay one is through boundaries which I'm like yeah I'm getting that but what is the other way right besides like taking care of your physical needs or showing yourself love and compassion because in mostly in relationship it's like it, as you said it boils down to love right yeah. yeah like whether you call it respect or being seen you know it all seems to come down to that yeah, yeah. so how how do you do that you right? just described it well <laughs> you just described it beautifully that's how you do it yeah. Is you, you, maybe you sit with that question of, I really value respect and how can I offer myself deep respect right now? Mm -hmm. And yeah. maybe respect is maybe the first level of respect is I'm just going to listen to my own pain around this. I'm going to be with myself with my own pain. And maybe mm -hmm. another level of respect would be, um, expressing myself or, you know, holding myself with respect 
holding my body, embodying respect. You know, there's lots of different ways mm -hmm. to live out our values. We can live out our values through how we hold our bodies, through how we speak to ourselves and how we act, how we act in the world. And it's really unique to you. So it, it's more of a, like, that's a question. Stephen Batchelor talks about dropping a question into your belly. And that would be a question to drop into your belly in, you know, in a meditation. What does it mean to respect myself? Yeah. And maybe as simple as just acknowledging that, you know, I, I'm aware of this, that I am not feeling respected in this moment, or I have a need to be seen and I don't feel seen right now. Right. So just that acknowledgement is already a way of seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Acknowledgement is a way of seeing and seeing as the ultimate is a very foundational aspect of respect to yeah. not look away. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm just interested in the whole values thing, but yeah. yes, there's, yes, okay. we could, there's lots of stuff on values. It's, it's yeah. exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So some other questions I, I see there's okay. other. Let me go on to uh, George then. Yeah. Thanks Art. And thanks Diana. I have found that compassion for myself, being a friend has been so helpful and also catching those second darts. And so I wondered if you could speak to any uh, thoughts you have, uh, since I see it within myself and I see others, you know, we tend to apply a lot of darts after the initial uh, activating event and we're not compassionate and not uh, a best friend to ourselves sometimes. So I just wondered if you have any uh, wisdom secrets to pass along in that area of, of for catching those extra darts, arrows, if you will. Yeah, the arrows. Um, you know, one thing that that I sometimes see that is, is that the second arrows uh, sometimes are, are, are misguided attempts to help ourselves in the way that, um, so, you know, we're, we're being self-critical to get ourselves back in line, right? You know, if, if, if my son beats himself up enough, then maybe he'll be a better catcher next time. Really? And we have this misconception um, that being self-critical or being harsh with ourselves will motivate us to do better or will help us learn from our mistakes. And the opposite is actually really quite true, you know, the true. And, and oftentimes these second arrows have to do with stories that we add on to the first arrow right? The, the narrative that we add on. One thing that's really helped me with that is looking at it from a contextual lens that a lot of those second arrows, um, either we learned when we were kids by ways that people spoke to us, they have to do with our brain's negativity bias, which is to look for faults and to add a story onto everything. Cause our brain just doesn't like to be with things as they are. We always want to create a problem and solve a problem and, um, add on. The second arrows also can ha can do with the second arrows of our of our culture of our society things like discrimination things like bias things like the media that we're consuming that isn't always um, in the place of compassion. I have a um, I have a client who she she said she wrote she wrote two blog posts and she put them on LinkedIn, and one of them the title of the blog post was called something like the psychological torture of my job. And the other, the blog post was called, I am enough. And she said, I was so, it was so unusual because the psychological torture of my job got like a thousand clicks, but the I am, I am enough got like very little, right? Because we're so, you know, we're so inundated with this messaging, right? And so sometimes the second arrow isn't, isn't actually even our own arrow. It's an arrow coming from society around us. And so how I work with with second arrows is exactly, you know, you're already halfway there if you've, if you've been able to identify it as a second arrow. And if we can allow those to come in and not have them be so up close, but rather have a little bit of distance and, and name them, the practice of just naming, oh, that's the story. Oh, that's the critic. Oh, that's, you know, it, 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 whatever it is, that's the self judgment or the other judgment that's causing more harm. And you can, you can name it and you can look at it and you can hold it lightly. We may not always be able to get rid of it. There's actually some research on the more we try and get rid of stuff, the louder it gets. So we don't need to necessarily get rid of it, 
but we can get a little space from it. And then maybe with this hand over here, kind of catch that arrow, okay? With this hand over here, we can go back to the first arrow and we can come back to the body and we come back to what is the hurt and offer compassion for the hurt. And that's that's really the practice of, of noticing, holding lightly or letting go and coming back to offer compassion because uh, we all we all have it, we all do it. We don't wanna get judgmental about our second arrows because then we have a third arrow <laughs> and it becomes more problematic. Um, those are my thoughts on it, but I'm also curious what your thoughts are, what you do, what your practice is. George may not be there anymore. Should we move on to uh, yeah. Larry? Sure. Larry yeah. Best, what a great name. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Diana. I, you're, I just loved what you shared as um, a, a father of two young adults. I could really, I wish I heard what you just shared like uh, eight, 10 years ago. Um, and so, like my younger child is really um, going through a lot of challenges right now. And, um, you know, it is, um, and so I would, I'm wondering if you could, you know, if you were to apply ACT, building upon the story you told about your son to the young, you know, young adult population, you know, maybe even as an alternative to DBT, um, as um, as my son, you know, he had it, it, and and the focus. Sorry about the dog is uh, around school avoidance, and you know, he has dyslexia, and he shames himself, and he's so hard on himself, and doesn't give himself the space to like make mistakes and then he blames everyone around him and you know I could go into more detail but and he's very empathetic and he's such a good friend to everyone else but himself and then he uh and it it can be yeah and I just want to you know have him believe that he's he's just such a beautiful amazing human being but he but the system is punishing of him because they don't, I feel, see him for who he is. So I'll stop there and hope my question was sufficiently yeah. clear. Yeah, well, I guess the first part is just compassion for you as a parent. Um, talk about doing what is hard to do and um, enduring what is hard to endure when your child is struggling and you see the beauty of your child. Because I think a parent... A parent can see their beauty in their child like no other. Um, same thing with a pet owner. <laughs> you see the beauty in your animal. You're like, that isn't my isn't my dog the cutest? And you see that in your in your child, and you see the full expression of them. And it, and it's hard when they are struggling. And you also can, like a parent can, um, see the ways in which maybe they're tripping themselves up. Right. Because something like avoidance of uh, when we when we struggle and then we avoid the world, we tend to struggle more because we isolate ourselves and our life becomes more and more narrow. And one thing that um, I think that uh, I learned early on from Thich Nhat Hanh was the practice of watering seeds. And the practice of watering seeds is 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 exactly what you just did with with all of us is you just shared the beauty of your son and you watered those seeds in him and continuing to water those seeds, not in a false, like you're good enough, you're smart enough, gosh darn it, people like you, but in a, in a watering the seeds that you would love for him to continue to grow and build and acknowledging them and speaking, you know, saying them like these, I see these strengths, I see these qualities in you. Um, and I see your struggle and how hard it is to be you. I do believe that um, our young adults right now, I'm actually, I'm teaching a class right now, a, a class on climate resilience. It's a nine UC wide um, course that's uh, being researched um, in terms of how to work with our young adults in terms of their distress that they're facing around, not just climate change, but just their future. 
and also the what they've gone through in terms of social isolation and COVID and how and technology and how it's impacted them um, in such a significant way. And they're navigating so much. And I do think that um, our young adults need us as you know compassionate, wise advisors to remind them of those strengths and see the wisdom within them, and then encourage them to step outside of their comfort zone just a little tiny bit to broaden that zone of flexibility. And that may be watering the seeds of, if you see him doing something that um, stretches him a little, reinforce that, encourage that, remind him of that, remind him of other times where he has stretched and he's grown. And also remind him that he's not alone in his struggle. Um, we all, many of us exist within systems that don't fit. That's why I wanted to be a snail when I grew up. I was like, go inside my shell. I can make my own walls in here. And I'm sure that, um, you know, that it's very difficult given his um, situation to exist within a system that doesn't fit him. But those would be some recommendations. I do think ACT is great for young adults and adolescents because of its heavy emphasis on values and its heavy emphasis on the human condition, which is you are not abnormal for struggling all of us struggle. It's part of being human. You're not abnormal for having a critical brain, mind. All of us have a critical mind and brain and we can work with, we can work with it. We can learn tools and strategies. And you can have, listen to my podcast. Adolescents like it or the young adults like it too. Wise effort show. Shall Ole? we move on to Melinda? Oh, Melinda? Let me see if I can unmute. Thank you, Diana, very much. Um, I guess, it, uh, please forgive me if this seems redundant um, and that you've already addressed this, but how do you, how does someone sustain or maybe endure is a better word, self-respect in challenging non-equal scenarios where there's not a lot of volition there. Um, there's not a lot of choice to be able to walk away. It's not easy to walk away from your employer or manager, if it's right. a challenging, difficult situation, um, exactly. other than looking for other work, of course, but that takes time. Uh, landlord tenant situations are absolutely miserable. They're not based on equality. Um, I'm talking about justice. One of my values very much is justice. And I'm proud of that. I don't only, I, rec I represent myself, but I also represent in my heart and soul, other people. How do you, it's so hard. It, it's just, it, it erodes your, your values at a certain point when you cannot escape the situation. Right. Um, how, how do you sustain? Yeah. Well, I think what you're pointing to is systemic issues, you know, systemic contexts where there's inequity or there's power differential or there's differences in terms of privilege or resources. Right. And for me, systemic problems require systemic solutions, not individual solutions. To expect one person to be able to sustain self-respect when you're in a system of oppression or in a system where you don't have power or you have less power is almost adding to the problem because then you're in the position of like, now I'm expected to have self-respect right and, and and live out this value of respect when i'm when i'm being pummeled or being controlled in some way and so for me if if systemic problems require systemic solutions then one thing that i would really recommend is to try and find community whether that's community of other people that are within the space that you're in if you can find affiliate groups or if you can find other you know other tenants in your building where you have a jerky landlord, or if you can find other people that you can feel that you're not alone. And this is just the nature of humans is that we are not meant to be alone in our, in our struggles or in our suffering. And you, we've all had that, that sort of boosting feeling of like, just a, just a friend, just someone that hears us and relates to us. But sometimes we can't find community within our small spaces. And so we need to look for community um, online or look for community in, in other ways to, to get that feeling, you know, an act of self-respect is to say, I need help and I need support. And maybe I can find that online, or maybe I can find that through a Sangha like this. Maybe I can find it in other places where you um, can be heard and maybe 
even with a larger community, then activism can start to occur depending on what kind of situation you're in to be able to, in some way, feel like you are supported towards some kind of change. But I do think this is one of the um, real downfalls of psychology and one of the real problems actually with my field of clinical psychology is that for a long time, it's been focused on the individual and sort of that we all need to boost up our inner resources, which yes, we do. And we live within systems and it's, you know, systemic um, issues are not up to the individual to solve alone. Should we move on uh, for one last question? A brief one from Oli. Dr. Hill, thank you for being here. And I think you basically addressed what I was concerned about. I put it in the chat. Step into the negative side a bit, RE folks who value power and wealth at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. I was trying to see how this fits in and you just helped illustrate that. I was thinking of Machiavelli at all. They may be some sick puppies, but that's how they see the world. So for me, what I got from you was be a friend to them, even if it means putting on a surgical gown and asbestos gloves and be careful, but a, come from a perspective of friendship as opposed to having the dukes up. It, does that make sense? Yeah, I would say a perspective of friendship. You know, sometimes I'll have clients in my office and they'll, they'll talk about, you know, somebody that's very difficult in their life. And we'll be doing a compassion practice and I'll be like, where do you want to put them? Do you want to put them across the, across the room or do you want to put them across the field when you're practicing this compassion? And even just in your own imagery that, um, the practice of compassion is, I think what is necessary to solve a lot of the problems on our planet. Right. And we also need to protect, protect ourselves. Does it mean that you bring harm? into your home or into your workplace or um, into even a conversation. Sometimes our practice of compassion or our practice of forgiveness is done just through the imagery of just offering a wish for someone's heart to be softened, or even just an understanding that when people are harming others, it's coming from a place of harm within themselves and offering them a wish for that harm to be healed so that they will not harm others. I mean, when we, when we heal the all of us, we heal the parts of ourselves that are hurt and we care for the parts of ourselves that are hurt, then we're less likely to enact hurt on another person. And so I would agree. Yeah. That, that ultimately is what friendship is. 